If you look at the price action in Bitcoin since the altcoin rally has been going nuts, Bitcoin's been sideways chopped to slightly higher. It's not been really ripping higher. Hello everyone. Today our master trader Gareth Soloway joins Benjamin Cowan in this stimulating discussion about the prospects of the altcoins rally, the expectations of Bitcoin to either break out or drop out, and macro analysis. Join our vibrant community of like-minded enthusiasts as we decode market dynamics, discuss cutting-edge trends, and share valuable tips to navigate the exciting realms of crypto, Bitcoin, and stocks. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. The cryptocurrency market recently experienced events that were previously expected to present a severe negative price impact, and yet, Bitcoin, BTC, traded near $37,000 on November 22, essentially flat from three days prior. Such performance was utterly unexpected, given the relevance of Binance's plea deal on November 21 with the United States government for violating laws involving money laundering and terror financing. You know, all coins have made quite the run in the last couple weeks, and uh, we'll have to see again, does it continue or does it pull back? I will say this. So, you know, going into this, we talked about, or at least I talked about some potential bullish pattern breakouts on alts. I was long some alts, but I will go on record now and say that I am short alts now. So, so again, this is a trader's life. Not everyone's a trader. I understand that, but, um, but again, you've seen some of these runs. They've gotten way ahead of their skis, in my opinion. And, and I do think that we're due for a pullback. And I was curious, you know, what are your thoughts on what's going on? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that we sort of I mentioned before is, is you know, if, if the altcoin market moves, it's only because Bitcoin moved first, right? It's only because Bitcoin <coughs> made, a, made a compelling move to the upside first. And look, as long as Bitcoin stays, what, you know, 37, 38K, Right, as long as it's not moving too quickly in either direction, whether it's to the upside or the downside, the altcoin market, um, you know, will take every opportunity that it can get to to make that move. I was looking at total three. It actually, this is the first higher high that it's made. Um, this is I mean, this is a series of lower highs basically ever since November of 2021, which is interesting because Bitcoin made its first higher high, you know what, like almost a year ago now. I mean, maybe like 10 months ago or so, it, it made its first higher high. It took the altcoin market an extra, you know, eight, nine, 10 months before it did the same. So that is at least one development, you know, that's I think worth at least notable. But I guess the the thing is, is like, you know, when Bitcoin gets a pullback, uh, whenever that may be, what happens to the altcoin market, right? Does it does it put in like a, a higher low? Um, does it does it just go and put in new lows again? I mean, we saw what in October there were plenty of altcoins putting in new lows. So I think that'll be sort of the the big test for the altcoin market is how does it hold up whenever Bitcoin gets a pullback? What do you what do you think about? It? I mean, if you're I know you were long alts over the last few weeks, but you are you starting to sniff out a pullback? Yeah, that's where I am. And let me show my chart because we can go over a few of these different altcoins that I'm kind of eyeing here. So. Um, you know, this is the Bitcoin chart and Bitcoin, honestly, Bitcoin still looks pretty good. You know, you have what you have this flat top and you have this upsloping uh, trend line here. And generally price will break to the upside when you have a flat top. So this line gets up, you know, squeezes price and eventually pushes price through the upside. So I actually expect further upside on Bitcoin, but I don't necessarily think that that's bullish for alts. I think if Bitcoin really starts to get a bid, it may actually take some power away from the alts. And what we could see here is actually, if you look at the price action in Bitcoin since the altcoin rally has been going nuts, Bitcoin's been sideways chopped to slightly higher. It's not been really ripping higher. The rip actually came prior to that, right? So, so then if we just look at some of these alts out here, like take a look at Solana, which has had an amazing run. Solana actually hit an upsloping trend line starting all the way back in, you know, we're basically going back to 2021 through some pivot points and we actually did hit a little high pivot this candle here see this big green candle up and then this candle down that's known as a reversal candle 
where again, it is basically the red reverses the entire green. We actually saw that on Bitcoin a couple of times when it was still making moves to the downside. And then you're getting these inside bars, which are actually bear flags. So we're starting to see, you know, this is the first time in the altcoin market where we're starting to see some bearish signals emerge. A couple other charts that I've been watching. Um, let's look at Cardano here, uh, ADA. Um, Cardano has had an amazing move up, but it's stalling right at some of these previous levels here. Um, a couple others as well. Let me think about which other ones I have in the portfolio right now on the short side. Um, I did pick up near and it's a little bit of a smaller one, but I think it's still about a, a billion dollar market cap. But we just hit into this level about the two dollar eighteen cent level. But look at these moves, right? Again, you know, charts tend to, you know, think about a rubber band, right? You can stretch the rubber band and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter the more you stretch it. So it can be a big stretch, but at some point it snaps back. And by no means do I know if maybe, maybe we are in a bull market in the altcoins. I mean, I have no clue. But what I do know is that probability wise, the more extended charts get, there tends to be this reflex snapback before the next move up potentially. Uh, and again, we could still go back to the lows for all I know. But but again, for me, it's it's looking for these shorter term opportunities, um, being long early on when things were depressed. Now things are not depressed anymore. They're extended. So I look to take moves on the short side. One, one thing that you mentioned that I can, can sort of, I, I, I would agree with is, you know, if Bitcoin makes a strong move in either direction, right, whether it's up or down, that's normally where the altcoin market starts to show weakness with, you know, relative to Bitcoin. This is that chart. I, we, we've sort of talked about it a few times over the last, you know, several months, like that total three, you subtract out USDT, you divide it by Bitcoin. And, you know, it, it based at this point, it is still a lower high, right? So like, you know, alts on their USD pairs just put in a higher high, alts on their Bitcoin pairs have still not really taken out any of these prior highs. And I, I think that is sort of sort of representative of the fact that alts are still weak with respect to Bitcoin, right? So like if Bitcoin were to rally beyond 38K, I, I would have to imagine that altcoins would likely go down against Bitcoin again. Um, I mean, you can see last cycle, like it, it actually took uh, several attempts, in fact, to sort of break down this level, right? You had, it was on your, it was really on the third attempt that it finally broke down. But by the way, when alts broke down here against Bitcoin last cycle, that was actually on a, on, a, on a Bitcoin rally, right? It was the last rally that we had in 2019. It was like that June timeframe, um, just before the Fed started to cut rates. And, and that was where we finally saw the, the altcoin market sort of go into the final drop against Bitcoin. And then they slowly started to turn it around as we got into, say, like the halving year and, and QE, QE returned. But that was what Ether Bitcoin was doing, right? It had these four tops, sort of came, in down, came down into these lows. Um, and then after that, it, it basically rallied all the way back up to make people think that it was going to go to new highs, right? But in fact, it, it, it just ended up being a lower high. And then we had this, this descending wedge, right? Which I think technically is more often than not, it's a bullish pattern. But I think when it's, you know, when it's near highs, it doesn't necessarily have to break to the upside, right? And I, I was very vocal that it would likely break down. So... My opinion right now is, is that the most likely direction for it still remains down. But I also know like there, there is some seasonality associated with, with Ethereum, with the exception of last year. So like a lot of times, like mid-December or January, Ethereum can start to show some strength against Bitcoin. But last year was an exception, right? Like last year, if you look in January, I mean, Ether just started going down against Bitcoin. Um, so that seasonality doesn't necessarily always come into play. And what's interesting... If you look at if you look at this move, after coming down into this range, we had you know two green candles, a red, and then one more green before we had sort of the the decision candle that took us back up. Right here we are. We got two green, a red, a green. I almost wonder if uh, if next week will be uh, will be decision time. You know on on which way it's ultimately going to break. And one thing that I was also looking at with regards to Ethereum is, you know, I, I've basically been expecting it to continue to underperform Bitcoin for, for the last year. And I think it's probably going to continue. But if you look, this is the running one year ROI of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And the orange line is Bitcoin, right? So you can see that it has started to show relative strength against Ethereum, right? Like clearly Bitcoin is starting to outperform Ethereum here. So my expectation is that eventually Ether Bitcoin breaks down to 0.03 to 0.04. 
But you know, I don't know if it's going to happen this year or if it's going to sort of get a bounce in the end of the year and then happen next year. Check this out. I had all these trend lines of support here on the dollar, and the dollar has now broken below. And I think this is this is something interesting here. So, I mean, the dollar is really starting to go into kind of a pseudo free fall here. We do have some support around 103 on the, the Dixie. But if it continues down, there's this trend line down here that stretches all the way back to 2021. And you're talking about going down to about 10170, 10160 here. So again, you know, the question then is, is, you know, and this is a weird juxtaposition. I talked about this in my game plan this morning, is that I have the dollar breaking lower and continuing lower, but I have rates actually starting to stall out. And if we look at the 10-year yield here, the 10-year yield's actually into support and actually higher today. And so right. what's weird about this is that generally rates and the dollar go together. Right. So so we've seen when when yields fall and the dollar falls, the markets rally. But here we're seeing a little bit of divergence. And the only thing that I can make sense of from this is that is it possible that the markets, the bond markets starting to understand that the economy is going to weaken substantially, but inflation is not going to drop substantially. Right. Because if inflation drops substantially, then yields would come down. Then the Fed could ease right. more. But again, if the economy weakens, so essentially like stagflation, right? The idea of stagflation, a very weak economy, but potentially inflation keeping rates 4%, 4.5%. What do you, you know, any thoughts on that? It'd almost probably be worse than a recession, honestly, if you had, you know, something like that play out. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the dollar has been notably weaker over the last over the last couple of weeks. The only thing that I, and again, like, Momentum is a hell of a thing. I mean, like, you know, when, a lot of times you just ride momentum and it, it works until it doesn't, right? But um, with regards to the dollar, I, it's sort of like how the euro relates to the dollar. So I, I don't know if you remember, but like back in October, I I, we, I drew this out, right? Like where I, th I said, hey, like it's probably going to rally back up because nothing goes down in a straight line, right? Like if the euro is going down against the dollar, it's not just going to go down in a straight line. There will be some type of like back test, right? I think you would call it like the scene of the crime, right? Sort of yep, back test exactly. the scene of the crime. And, and you can kind of see that like it, it's actually doing that right now, right? Like it it, it had this rally um, and it's I obviously didn't draw it perfectly. Like it, it, it's, you know, it's still moving higher a couple of weeks later, but that's an interesting spot for the dollar or sorry, for the euro against the dollar about 109, one, you know, going between 109, 110. So I'd be watching this, right? Like, does this actually break back out and get up here? Then yes, the dollar is in free fall. But if this is right. a rejection, if this is a rejection, by the way, by you know, I mean, for, for you know, a lot of times, if, if the euro is going up against the dollar, that's kind of a sign that we're in risk on, right? If if the euro right. is going, up. but if, if if the euro gets rejected here, then you could you know you could switch back to risk risk off, um, very very quickly. So look, I I think you, there, there there are a lot of elements with the bond market of you know the, the bond market. What TLT went to like what like eighty two, eighty three, something like that. Um, yeah. I, I I think it's either the lows or pretty close to the lows, right? Like, you know, because I, I don't think that the economy will be able to handle like, you know, high rates forever. I, I think eventually, eventually that will, that will ultimately filter through. But in the short term, the reason why, and I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. I don't know if you remember when, when Yellen, when, when the market, the, the, the treasury refunding announcement, the market was expecting longer duration to be issued, shorter duration was issued. And, and I was like, all right, guys, this is bullish for both stocks and bonds. And ever since then, I mean, stocks are up, what, 10%? Bonds are only up about 5%. Um, so I think that has, you know, that has something to do with it. I, I don't know, man. I, I think that Yellen, by doing that, it, it it basically allowed a lot of that pressure on the stock market to kind of come off, right? And that was why, you know, that was why back in October, I, I said it was at least short-term bullish for stocks. By the way, the S&P is, is, and the I think the NASDAQ is, is actually at a new yearly high. Isn't that right? I believe you're right. Yeah. I mean, it has been one of the craziest moves in the NASDAQ here. I'll show my screen on this because it is pretty impressive. So, you know, basically on the NASDAQ here, we have, uh, we're not quite at the new highs from July, but we're getting darn close. But the, the NASDAQ 100, that's different. We are making new right. highs here. Now, the difference here is that the NASDAQ 100 is just 100 stocks and it is ruled by basically five stocks now it used to be the magnificent seven tesla's now kind of become a mess and and um even meta's kind of meta's still strong but what's amazing about this couple stats that i was hearing over the weekend is that 
the hedge fund allocation in the top five stocks, so we're talking Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, and NVIDIA, is now the highest it has ever been in terms of allocation. So the way over leveraged in these big names. And they now, they of the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P, those are, it's now at new all-time highs for percentage of those, those indexes. So those five stocks now make up more than they ever have in those indexes. I think in the S&P, it's over 25% of the S&P is five stocks. And now over 50% is five stocks of the S&P, uh, of the NASDAQ 100. So again, you know, it, it, as long as the party's going on, it's great for investors, right? They will carry this market up on their back as long as the party goes on. Then if, if it doesn't and these start to fall, that's where things get crazy. Subscribe, like, and share. Let's make this journey to financial empowerment unforgettable.